So this is uh, basically our goals for today, and let's let's dive in. Okay, so let's talk about custom meshes. Okay, so when you are when you need to create a custom mesh, right? And remember, there are different types of geometry in computer graphics, but right now we are talking about exclusively of meshes, and meshes are either created by well, are always created by by faces, vertices, and faces, and those faces can be triangles or quads or any type or any other polygon, right? Usually, we want uh, triangles or quads. And here's a important difference that I want to, to discuss with you. Um, there's, there's a difference between, what, between the type of models we want for research and the type of models we want for uh, production for uh, video games and, 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 and VFX companies. And, and that, is, that is important for you to understand. So uh, in terms of research, if you're, <laughs> and again, that was my daughter. And <laughs> so if you're doing, if you're doing research uh, with, um, if you're doing geometry meshing uh, research, right? Either remeshing or just geometry processing research, we usually use uh, triangular meshes, right? And those triangular meshes, they need to have a very specific topology. We usually want like very, very good triangles, uh, Delaunay triangulations and things like that. We already discussed what is Delaunay triangulation. Um, if you don't remember, I think we we have a slide, a slide sorry, on uh, clipping, um, on our clipping presentation. So the thing is, be, the way we construct algorithms for research, we usually need triangles. However, in industry, usually people need squats. Uh, so if you're, for example, a VFX company like ILM and you're, you need, you're like doing, doing the Avengers uh, movies, right? And you need like, I don't know, like a military tank and things like that, you need 3D models, right? And those need models, they need to be manipulated by human modelers, right? By artists, right? Some of those models can be created by um, procedural algorithms, but in the end, you usually need people to maybe manipulate those 3D models. And for, for, a, for a human, manipulating a triangular mesh is way more complicated. It's way better to manipulate um, quad meshes, right? So actually, let me give me a second. Let me show you something. Give me a second. Um, so there is, in, in industry, there's a company called TurboSquid. Give me a second because I need to open the web page. What? Just a second. Yeah, here it is. Okay, can you see this web page? So this is a, this company called TurboSquid uh, was acquired by Autodesk. Autodesk is the company that they own Tree to Max and Maya and many other uh, computer graphics related software. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the, the biggest companies in terms of like computer graphics uh, software are yeah probably Autodesk and also Adobe, right? AutoCAD, right? They also own AutoCAD. So they acquired this company, and this company is basically a repository of 3D models, but like really, really, really good 3D models, like industry ready 3D models. So here, what you could see is the type of 3D models. The, the type of quality and the, the requirement of, of 3D models that is uh, needed for, um, uh, for example, a video game, video game company or a VFX uh, production company. And again, this is important because you maybe, you might end working, for example, at, uh, I don't know, at Pixar uh, as a TD modeler, creating algorithms to create procedural, procedural models or something like that, because you have computer science background and you are at least, I guess, because you, you are taking my course, you are interested in computer graphics. So you are maybe, right? Maybe you will aim to work on these type of companies. And um, 
So if you are doing algorithms, right, to, to, to create models or custom meshes like this, you need to comply with the type of quality that industry needs, right? So if, if I get, uh, for example, I can I can I, I can ask for this this uh, uh, the page to to show me only Checkmate Pro models. So Checkmate is basically like a quality certification that these guys created, and uh, and basically if if a model passes that certification, it means that it has exactly the geometrical uh, quality that is required for any VX, VFX company. So let me show you, for example, this 3D model right here. If you see, usually they have a lot of images and they have like a lot of description about the, 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 the models. So yeah, so for example, here you, you can see that the entire 3D model is created exclusively with quads. There are basically no triangles. So triangles are almost forbidden in industry, right? Uh, this is for BFX industry. However, in video games companies, um, for in video game companies, uh, they usually want low poly models, and low poly models can have triangles, right? So if you're interested, again, if you're interested in like diving, right, in this topic about like creating procedural models and custom meshes and things like that, which is impressively interesting, uh, you can you can go here, for example, the Turbo Squid, and you can read the the uh, the official standard for uh, their uh, their quality requirement. Right, so again, it's called, oh, I just forgot the name, I just said it, Checkmate. Yeah, so basically Checkmate Pro. So you can go and read the Checkmate uh, Pro certification and you will understand what is exactly you need to, um, yeah, to, to create models like this. And by the way, it's also a very nice business. So for example, look at this. It's, I mean, this entire thing is, one hundred and sixty-four dollars, right? But there are certain types of, of objects in in, in, in general, in three D models, that are very valuable. For example, uh, the rims, the wheels from cars. Wheels are very expensive. Like the three D model of wheels are very ex expensive. So uh, let me check car wheel. So if you go and check car wheels, you can see that they sell in a lot of money, right? For example, $24, this tire is $29. The thing is, this is a 3D model that some artist created, right? Some art, uh, yeah, an artist created this 3D model, and that artist is basically selling this in $29. Every time someone needs that model and buy that model, that artist is, is earning $29, $29 without doing anything else, right? The thing is, you could develop the skills, enough skills to create, for example, a tool that can create not, not only one tire, but thousands of different tires. And each of those can be sold for $29, models, $29 right? So that's a, the, the, the beauty of using math and using computer science, right? You can literally um, create procedural models that you can, that they, they could have the same quality of as if they were created by, by a human, right? Okay, so that is just to inspire you that this is a very, very interesting uh, topic in computer graphics uh, for research, but also for business, okay? So let's, let's uh, keep going with this. Let's uh, imagine that we want to create a custom mesh that is basically like a very simple grid, right? Just a plane, right? With a certain amount of segments, right? So if we, uh, we, if we need to do that, we basically need to create two arrays, right? It doesn't matter in, if you're working on, uh, on on trees to the max or or Maya or 3.js. We always uh, need to have uh, two arrays, one for vertices and one for faces. So basically the array of vertices will have just coordinates in 3D space, X, Y, Z coordinates. And the, 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 uh, the array of faces will have for each face, basically you have pointers to those uh, vertices, right? And what, what I mean uh, when I say pointers, I don't mean like C++ pointers. It's just like an index number, right? So again, imagine that you have an algorithm that basically is creating, right? Uh, in this case, 28 points, right? And you have a U coordinates or a U direction, right? And then a V direction. I'm not calling these guys X and Y because 
It doesn't need to be exactly aligned with X and Y. Just imagine that is there are your internal directions in, inside your algorithm from which you will basically create uh, either like segments, right? In this case, seven segments in the U direction and uh, four segments in V direction, okay? So once you have something like that, once you have those vertices, and let me just come back to my to my presentation. Give me a second. I need to click the presentation. Ah, where are your presentation? Here. Okay. So once once you have the vertices, right? Once you you created your vertices array, you can create your faces, right? So for each face, again, as I said, it's just like the index of those uh, vertices, right? So in this case, for example, the first face will will be one, two, nine, right? Or the first phase is basically created by the vertices one, two, nine. And here I am beginning the array with the number one because that is what three to the max ex expects. But in different systems, arrays, you know that right already, right? And it's in different systems, sometimes arrays begun in zero, sometimes in uh, arrays begun in, in, in one, right? So in, in particular, in trees to the max, if you're creating custom meshes, arrays begun with one, so the first vertex will be one, okay? And here's something that is also important. The direction, right? Uh, the direction of your, uh, your, your indices uh, basically defines the way the computer will be uh, will calculate the normal, okay? So remember that we, we have discussed uh, about this uh, uh, right-hand uh, rule, right? So usually in almost every computer graphic system that we know, uh, the normals are determined using the right-hand rule. It means that if, you're, if you imagine that you're, you put like your, your right hand on top, of my, on top of the monitor here, and you're basically like curling your fingers your thumb will be basically up, right? So this means that in order to compute the 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 normal of this uh, of this phase, you basically will compute this vector, right? Cross this vector, right? So two minus one cross uh, nine minus nine minus one, right? Uh, so if if I, for example, modify the way I'm naming, right, these indices right here, and instead of using this direction, I I basically name them uh, in the opposite direction, the computer will understand and will think that I want the normal to be like opposite. And that could be a problem, right? Uh, if you have a mesh, for example, if you're creating a custom mesh that is basically like, I don't know, like a sphere, every single triangle needs to have its normal pointing to the same direction, right? Otherwise you could have like one, so some of those normals are pointing outside, some of those are pointing inside and you, you could have problems with that, right? So those are the type of details that you need to be very careful. So um, for this um, area here, obviously we need at least uh, two triangles, right? So the second triangle will have coordinates, sorry, we have indices 198, right? 198, again, always, always following the same direction. And you basically just create a very simple, very simple algorithm to just keep going, right? And as you can see, Right. Whenever you are creating like the next, the next, the next, the next uh, phases, you will start to see a pattern. Right. So this is basically phase number one, phase two, then three, four, five, six, seven. This side of phases are the ones that are blue. Right. These are the purple ones, and you will see that basically is there is like a pattern. So this, in this case in particular, seems uh, kind of easy. But this is one of the things that are very tricky when you need to implement uh, a custom mesh. Uh, the way you need to like, uh, yeah, the, the way you, you need to like create your your variables inside your your faces indices to basically um, comply with uh, different segments or different shapes or different stuff, right? So, yeah, that is usually something that it is kind of tricky to understand exactly what is the pattern that you're following here the pattern is super obvious right so it's the pattern is 1 2 3 4 2 3 4 5 9 10 11 12 so for example the next the next step here right so if so if it, it, it is uh, 1 2 9 right this 9 right is basically the number is basically the number 1 right plus 
the number of U segments, right? Which is seven plus one, right? So it's one plus seven plus one, it will be nine. And, and we, will, we will basically do that on our code, okay? And, and that's it. You basically keep going and then the end you have a custom mesh, right? So let me show you the example. Let me open trees to the max. Okay, so. Okay, so here's a very uh, short example. So uh, I will explain a little bit later what 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 is this part. Uh, can you see this? Can you see my code? Is is this the size is is good? Say yes if you think the size is good. I mean I, I can okay good. So uh, here I'm creating the arrays right. I'm creating two empty arrays. Then I am defining uh, how many segments I want for each direction. So I I want uh, 10 segments on the U direction, uh, 10 segments on the V direction. I can obviously modify it, right? Maybe I can say, okay, I only want seven on the V direction. Uh, I'm defining a gap, which is basically the size or the, the separation between the, the segments. Uh, and you will see later that that you might don't need that, right? When, when you, we, you're dealing with more uh, sophisticated geometries. And here is a very simple um, uh, four cycle to create vertices, right? So, of course, we need to iterate, right, in U and V. And U and V, ba basically, they kind of become like coordinates in this system, right? Uh, so it's like a coordinate in your number of segments uh, uh, coordinates, coordinate system. And basically, I'm just creating a position in X and a position in Y. In this case, in particular, I am... Uh, I am using uh, the U and V as uh, X and Y uh, positions, right? But again, you will see later that that doesn't it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that these U and V coordinates are literally related with X and Y, right? The way you compute the coordinates, the the the, the 3D coordinates for your vertices can be super different, right? But in this case, I'm using X one X and Y. And um, I'm giving, uh, for the set position, I'm giving zero. And remember, in 3D Studio Max, because this, it is maybe a, a bit confusing, in 3D Studio Max, the coordinates on the floor are X and Y. And the vertical axis is the Z. Maybe, I think someone already noticed that uh, with when I was doing my, my, uh, my inverse kinematic uh, extra video, right? And, and I think a lot of people got confused when you were uh, answering the exam, and um, but, but you need to get used to that, right? So in in computer graphics, we we are always switching between axes. So for example, Maya is is the opposite. Maya is using the ones on the on the floor are uh, is X and Z, yes, and the Y is basically the one that is coming from your monitor. Uh, I think Unity is also using uh, vertical Z. So yeah, depending if you're using Blender or Maya or whatever, sometimes you need to switch. This is just a convention for every software. So in this case, the vertical the vertical axis or the vert vertical coordinates, I'm just uh, putting zero. So I will basically create like a grid on the floor. And uh, I'm just appending, right, new vertex. I am appending to the vertex array. And then I'm creating my my faces, right? And here's when it is sometimes tricky, right? So this is where uh, I was telling you that you need to put your uh, the pattern that you see when you need to create your faces, right? So we know the pattern. Let me just come back a little bit. So this is this this pattern, right? So the pattern is one, two, three, four. The thing is, this is one, two, three, four for this segment, right? For the next segment, it will be eight, nine, ten, eleven, blah, blah, blah. For the next one, it will be fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So you need to just do some very quick math to understand what is exactly the pattern. So in this case, the pattern for the first phase is U, right? Our, our coordinate U plus U segments times V, which is this variable that goes from one to uh, the number of segments minus one, um, minus one, right? So basically on the first segment, that will be zero, right? So you're not, you, you are not adding the number of segments from U. On the next uh, segment, 
it will be one. So you're adding, you're basically multiplying u segments times one, right? And again, you can see the code and basically uh, dive in, in this code and kind of understand it. And after you finish creating your uh, or appending every single face on your phrases array, at least in three to the max, you do this. You say, okay, new mesh is equal to mesh. And then you give the vertices array and the faces array, and we compile with control E and we have our custom mesh, right? And of course it's very, it's very simple. It's just, right, you just agreed, but it's there, right? And it has triangles and it's perfectly fine. And, and, and it, is, it is parametric, right? Because we can actually modify things. So if you want to, I don't know, play with other uh, stuff, you could also, um, you could also say, for example, ah, give me a second. Um, let me think. What what could we do? Okay, we could, for example, use a sine wave, maybe sine of u times fifty, right, to increase the to increase the frequency, and maybe times eight to increase the, to modify. No, sorry. I need to write sign. Yeah, that's it. So, for example, here, right? I mean, it's 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 already right a bit more interesting because the, at, in the end, what we are doing here is just we are creating the basic structure of a uh, of a mesh patch, right? Remember, last uh, in, in our last lecture, I was uh, showing you that you can basically create like, you can create sophisticated shapes or sophisticated models using curve networks. And basically each curve network is formed by quadrilateral patches. This is basically the code for those patches, for at least the structure of faces and, and vertices for those patches. The only thing that is that it will change is basically this line of code, right? The way you compute the positions of those vertices, right? It will basically modify the shape of, of the entire mesh, right? Okay, good. Uh, any question from this code or from this concept? No? Can I can I continue? I guess. I guess so, right? Okay, good. So let's continue. Let me come back to my presentation. Okay. Okay, so let's now talk about Bezier groups. So, because again, what we have there is just the uh, topology structure for a uh, for a surface patch. Okay, but now we want to modify the positions of those uh, vertices using interesting curves, right? So the curves that we could use are basically this Bezier curves. These are uh, the most um, the most used curves in computer graphics are super, super easy to code and they're, yeah, basically everywhere, okay? So this is like a graphical explanation of a Bezier curves. These, uh, these animations are, are very cool. I, I was, uh, I was uh, about to create my own animations and I just remembered that the Wikipedia page is, is, uh, it has also these uh, very nice animations. So I think this is enough, right, to understand. So basically we have different types of Bezier curves depending on their grade. So this is a quadratic Bezier curve or a, a Bezier curve of grade two, which basically has three control points and two segments, right? So it has two segments, it's quadratic. So this one is, it has three segments, so it is cubic. This one has uh, four, uh, yes, a so four segment, sorry, it's five segments, so it's quartic, okay? And, and you can keep going. You can keep going creating well, like more uh, sophisticated Bezier curves. But as you can see here in the animation, it's always exactly the same concept, right? So basically for each segment, you have a point, right? A fictitious control point that is just traveling along each segment, right? And this, that is basically a linear interpolation, right? I, I guess everybody will understand that. And then from those, in the case of quadratic one, in, the, uh, in between those fictitious control points, right? They are obviously forming a line and you also compute, right? Another uh, linear interpolation. And basically that is where your ending position will be. And that is your curve. 
Uh, in the case of the cubic, it's exactly the same. As you can see, for each segment, we have a fictitious green point that is traveling in this linear interpolation. And once you interpolate the first uh, fictitious points, you get, you had uh, three segments, and now you have two segments, right? So basically, these green segments, right, are actually a quadratic Bezier curve, right? So a quadratic Bezier curve is solved exactly the same, right? You need to create, now these fictitious blue points are traveling along those lines as a linear interpolation, and quartic will be the same, right? So that is basically what, what we do in Bezier curves. Uh, quadratic Bezier curves are sometimes useful. For example, I, uh, that is what I wanted to uh, for you to use on your um, transformation assignment for the bonus part. But usually what most computer graphics uh, software uses are cubic Bezier curves, okay? So again, let me show you code. Let's go. Okay, give me a second. Okay, so let me here's your example. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I have a scene in which I have uh, three control points, right? So these control points are point 0.1, point 0.2, and point 0.3. And I have this object right here, which has uh, it has its pro the, uh, property in Trueso Max that if I move that object, if I animate that object, it will show me its trajectory, right? Um, so this guy is called Chester. For some reason, I like to call things Chester. Um, and yeah, so basically it's like a little sphere. So let's see the code. Let's see, this is basically the code that we were, that we did, or it's a very, very similar code that we did on our first uh, lecture, I think. And uh, yeah, let me just copy this very quickly. This will be, this will be like a scale factor. And just, just copy the yeah, other this. Repeating this code is, is kind of ugly, right? Yeah, so what is happening here is, uh, we need we are computing uh, two vectors, right? So vector one is basically this position minus this position, right? So point two minus point one. Vector two will be this segment, right? So remember this is a quadratic Bezier curve, so we are we are we have two segments, right? And then we are computing two fictitious new control points, right? Because right now we have control point one, control point two, control point three. We have three. But we need one control point that will travel in this direction and another control point that will travel in this direction, right? So those are this, CP4 and CP5. Now CP4 and CP5 is just a linear interpolation. You get the vector, the corresponding vector, in this case, this one, right, for CP4. And you just multiply by scale factor. And scale factor is just the step in which you are, right? And divided by the total number of steps. Um, so the thing is, Bezier curves are a linear interpolation, right? So, but it's uh, a discrete interpolation, of course, right? It's not a, it's not a actually a continuous object, right? It is obviously discrete. So you you need to identify in how many segments on how many steps you are defining your curve, right? So in this case, for example, I am defining my my curve to have 100 steps. So basically, I have my animation is is on, and I will animate this Chester object, right? from the frame zero to frame 100, and I will basically have a sample, right? A, an interpolation sample for each of those um, uh, frames, right? Because I will basically have uh, until uh, 100. But I can modify that. I could, for example, modify that and say, okay, no, I don't want 100. I want only the first 20 frames. I will only send 20 segments, right? So depending on which frame are you, Right, so maybe you are in number 10 or whatever. So for example, if you're in frame number 10, you are in frame number 10 out of a total of 20, it means that the scale factor will be 0 0.5. It means that that fictitious point 0, 0.0 CP4, sorry, it will be basically at half of the distance of this vector, right? 
and that is just a very quick uh, linear interpolation. Then you need to compute the vector three, right? The third vector, which is basically the the, the line that is, that is go, uh, going uh, along or basically connecting those control points, and we have our new position, and that's it. So if I compute this code, this is basically the result, right? This is basically the the uh, the curve. Uh, don't mind about these weird lines. Uh, I, I think this is a I think there is a way in Tree to Max to actually to actually remove those those things. Yeah, they look very ugly. But I if I just uh, unselect this thing, I think you can see. Yeah, if I put my mouse in here, yeah, that is basically the Bezier curve, right? And uh, and you can see that it only created 20, 20 steps, right? I have only 20, 20 steps on this Bezier curve, right? So this is a quadratic Bezier curve. What if you want to create a cubic Bezier curve, right? So in that case, instead of having three control points, now we need to have four control points. So I can create a fourth control point, which will be 0 0.04, uh -huh. and then it means that we will have uh, three segments, right? One, two, and three segments. So I have now a function called cubic Bezier curve, which basically is uh, computing vector one, vector two, vector three, right? Which are basically these vectors, right? One, two, and three. And then I have obviously the scale factor. It's exactly the same as the previous code. And I have now three fictitious points, right? Not two, but now three, right? Because I always need to create one fictitious point for every segment I have on my control points. So in this case, because it's a cubic basic curve, I have three, uh, uh, three segments. I have one linear interpolation for each of those segments. And then, instead of just keep going with this code, I can just compute the new position, sending or, or uh, calling the quadratic Bezier curve with these new control points, right? And basically sending the same step and total steps. I mean, I could literally copy this and basically continue everything, but because I already have a quadratic Bezier curve, and when you create these three control points, now you have two sections or two segments, and now that is basically a cubic Bezier curve, you can use basically that, that information and just call the other function, right? So I will probably need to uh, modify this. So this will be a cubic Bezier curve. And now I need to send another point, right? Because it asks for another point. So it will be number four. And I control E and that's it. Now this is the curve, right? So as you can see, if I move the points around, the curve is different, right? And that is how you compute Bezier curves. I mean, Bezier curves is a topic that if you are still interested in that, you, uh, you, you uh, the, the, the geometric modeling course from Ala Schaefer, uh, you will, yeah, they, they will talk a lot about, a lot about it. Uh, yeah, you can get way more information there, but, um, but yeah, but this is basically the basics and the way you can code it, which is basically the most important thing, right? There are um, uh, there are other ways to implement uh, Bezier curves. You can also, uh, I mean, uh, here I'm using uh, a, a method based on vectors. You can also compute Bezier curves using Bernstein polynomials, using matrices. Maybe some of you already do, done that before. Uh, you can also compute Bezier curves using something called um, Bezier, Bezier course of division, uh, which is like, a, it's a very nice way to compute Bezier curves to, to make them like um, adaptive to its curvature. But again, that is, those topics are from that other course, which is geometric modeling and not uh, computer graphics, right? Okay, good. So let's keep going. Questions? Questions about this code, Bezier curves? Would the amplitude increase if we increase total step? If by uh, if by amplitude you mean the the curvature? No. No, the curvature will basically be the same. The only thing is, so let me give me a second. Yes, Peter is exactly saying the, the 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 answer. So if you increase the steps, just your your curve will be smoother, right? Because you have more steps, you have more segments creating that that uh, the same curve, right? If you have just a couple of, of curves, yeah.
yeah let me show you very something very quickly because I can I can simulate that on 3 Studio Max very quickly so if I create a Bezier curve here sorry give me a second so this is a this is a quadrat sorry a cubic Bezier curve okay so this is the first control point the second control point third one right and fourth one okay so here ah, sorry one two three four control points here tree to the max allow me to modify the steps right so if i ask less number of steps the curve is exactly the same i'm just sampling less steps right so it just my curve looks horrible right so if i increase the number of steps that is basically this part of my code i was computing 20 yeah just my curve looks better right or here in Tristo Max for example you have this button here that it's it's called adaptive which basically will give you the the right amount of segments depending on the curvature right so you just don't care and that is done using subdivision Bezier curves but yeah but that is basically a more advanced topic that I, I, I just will have no time to cover that part but yeah it's a very good question Okay, good. So any other any other questions about this? Okay, so here's a question for you. Look at this curve. Do you think this is a Bezier curve? What do you think? No, Michael sa says no. Why not? P should not be on the curve. Ah, yes. Thank you, Michael. Yes, the formal, the formal, uh, uh, the formal explanation of that of, of what Michael says, <laughs> and Tommy is saying it says on the next slide. Yes, you're spoiling, spoiler alert. Um, yeah, that's that's why I I, I don't quite like to, to to give you the PDFs before. So one super important, super important um, uh, characteristic of Bezier curves is that Bezier curves only interpolate its first and last control point. So look at this, look at these images, right? They're only touching, right? It doesn't matter if it's quadratic, cubic, quartic, or whatever. They're only touching or only interpolating, right? The first and the last one, right? So the first and the last one, the first and the last one, right? So here it will touch the last one, right? So they they never interpolate the, 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 the ones uh, in between, right? So so yeah, this is not this is not a basic curve because Bezier curves only interpolate the first and last point. So the thing is, these are actually two cubic Bezier curves. And this type of construction is called spline. And that, again, splines are ubiquitous in computer graphics. They're everywhere and we use splines for a lot of things. Uh, we will, in this case in particular, we will use them to, to create custom meshes and modeling. But yeah, they're just everywhere, okay? so. A, a, a spline basically is it's uh, like a collection or a set of Bezier curves usually they are cubic Bezier curves and they're basically uh, together right there they need to like join in a very specific place and they also need to be continuous continuous means that the same curvature right you have the, exactly the same curvature coming out from this uh, curve on the left side and coming in on the curve on the right side. And uh, so here you can see that we had, originally we had three points, P0, P1, and P2. So again, this is this is a spline. So we have one cubic Bezier curve on the, right, on the left side and one cubic Bezier curve on the right side. And these uh, points here are basically the, the missing points, right? For you to construct a cubic Bezier curve, right? So these will be Give me, give me a second to show you. Right. So this will be like L0, L1, L2, and L3, right? Basically the control points from the left side or from the left cubic Bezier curve. And R0, R1, R2, and R3, which are basically the control points from the right side, right? So again, yeah, this is a spline. So the thing is, if I, again, if I come to trees to the max again, and I click on line and I ask for trees to the max to give me smooth a smooth line. If I click 
on my monitor, right? And I left left click. I have a beautiful beautiful curve, which is a smooth, right? And it is interpolating these uh, three vertices, right? But again, we know this is not exactly a Bezier curve. This should be a Bezier spline, basically several um, cubic Bezier, Bezier curves, right? So if I right click and I ask Tree Studio Max to like recompute the Bezier uh, curves, I will see that indeed these are two cubic Bezier curves, and I have one, two, three, four points for the first one, one, two, three, four points for the next one. The problem is. I, as a user, I only gave the first three, right? And the computer is somehow computing this, the missing points, the green ones, right? So do you have any idea on how to do that? Have you ever thought about that problem or any of you had seen something related with that? I guess not. Okay, so that is a problem that I will show you how to, <laughs> that is a problem I, I will show you how to deal with it, okay? Um, so, and it's not trivial in computer graphics. This is a very important thing in computer graphics because, again, everybody uses this type of splines. Uh, AutoCAD, Maya Blender, Illustrator, Photoshop, whatever, everyone has this type of, of, of constructions, right? So, yeah, so basically the goal is we need an algorithm to compute the green dots, right? So we have the red ones, we need to compute the green dots, right? They're also called handles. So in, in general, in, in, in computer graphics, when you're talking about, right, like moving things around, they're also, they're usually uh, called uh, handles. And the thing is, they cannot have just any position, right? They, they, they must have a very specific position for the curves to be continuous. Again, continuous means that they have the same, that the left side has the same curvature, right? It's coming out with the same curvature that the next one is like coming in with the same curvature. And th for that to happen, this vector right here, basically the vector L2 from L, uh, L2 uh, and R1, uh, you will see that this segment right here, so basically the segment from P1 and R1, needs to have exactly the same length than the segment P1 and L2, right? So that is super important. Again, if you take the geometric modeling curse with Ala Schiffer, you will, you will you will see that. That is one of the things that we need to, to have or have a continuous uh, curves. So this segment need to have the same length and also they need to have opposite direction, right? So they need to basically point to the same uh, direction. Again, if I come back to Trace to the Max and I show you, I can take, for example, this handle and I can modify its position. And if, if I, for example, change the direction I guess everybody, sorry, everybody will, eh, sorry. Eh, what happened? Yeah, I think everybody will agree that the curve is not continuous anymore, right? Because I'm changing the direction from which the other curve is basically coming out or coming in. And if I modify, maybe I keep kind of the same direction, but I modify this the, the size, you know, it also looks weird, right? So. Yeah, I'm also distorting the continuity, right? So in order to have really uh, real continuous uh, curves, the, we need to comply with that rule. So yeah, the thing is, there is a hard way to compute uh, those green green points. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, compute it as uh, an optimization problem, and yeah, like, there's a hard way with a lot of math, and there's the easy way with a lot of geometry, or basically the <laughs> Enrique's way, okay? basically a uh, another geometric theorem okay so I uh, developed this theorem or this geometry construction a couple of years ago and I've been using it for many years and it actually works pretty well it's based basically based on a very very simple observation right so let's look at this example in particular right so we have p0 p1 and p2 and we need to compute the green dots so this is basically the geometric construction let's call this vector b okay and let's call this entire vector the vector a okay so b it needs to has needs to have the same direction than a right so basically these two are parallel and b has one third of a's length okay and that's it 
that's it's, it's that easy okay so this because again I mean I have a right because I have p0 and p2 I have a right so this is just again it's a parallel line to a and it has a, a third of the length right and the same observation happens to be exactly the same for these points right here, right? With that observation, I could maybe compute the uh, L2 and, and R1. And then uh, this uh, segment right here, right, is basically parallel. So the segment D is parallel to C. It has the same direction and is one third of this, okay? And the segment F has basically the same direction of the segment E and it, it has exactly one third. And with that very simple geometric construction, you can compute those green dots super easy using vectors and you don't need to do any fancy stuff. Uh, so for example, if, if we, we come back here, maybe the first one you could compute uh, could be, for example, R R1, right? So R1 would basically be P2 minus P0, right? So this vector is right here, P2 minus P0, right? Uh, divided by six, right because now if this entire segment is one third it means that this is a small segment is one sixth right so basically you take this vector you divide it by six and then you just add b right and that's it you have r1 if you want now to compute l2 you just basically just invert r1 and now you have l2 and if you have now r2 and uh, l uh, sorry r1 and l2 in order to compute this guy here right l1 is, is is similar right so i have this point already right i'm already computed l2 so now i take the vector p0 minus p1 so it's this vector in this direction right so in direction from p1 to p0 so p0 minus minus p1 right and i uh, divide it by three right or i multiply by one third right and then just add l2 and i get to this point and that's it that's absolutely that's it right and uh and yeah that's basically a geometric construction and the good thing about that is this geometrical construction actually allows for you to create a a a, a combination of two cubic basic curves that actually comply with something that it's called the um oh, damn i just forgot the name it's another geometrical construction that proves that this thing is c2 continuous again this is these are topics that are uh, related with that other course from Alan Schaefer. Um, C zero continuous, C one continuous, C two continuous. It's, it's, it's a a geometrical um, um, actually no, it's, it's a differential a geometric uh, differential geometry um, property of curves. Um, yeah, but again, I, I I want I don't want to dive in that thing because that is not the topic of this course, and we will just. No, we don't have time for that, okay? But for, for you, just that is, that's it. That is a, uh, a, a geometrical construction that it, it will give you exactly the same result, mathematically, numerically, exactly the same result as if you do the, the hard way, okay? So let me show you something. Give me a second. And, okay. Um, Oh, okay. So someone is asking, sorry, why do we want to calculate the handles? Well, because without the handles, you cannot compute the curve, right? So this is a cubic Bezier curve, right? So because it is a cubic Bezier curve and you want to compute that, the curve, you want you want the curve, uh, you need to have four control points, right? You need to have one, two, three, four control points. And originally, you only had three points, the red ones, right? So if you only had the red ones, you have not enough information to compute compute uh, Bezier curves, right? So you compute the green ones, and now you have enough information to compute those uh, cubic uh, cubic curves, okay? Um, okay, so give me a second. So it's so it's uh, 3.54 already, and again, I will definitely not finish the presentation today uh, at 4 p.m. If, yeah, if you need to leave at 4 p.m., that's, that's, that's good, but I, I, I yes. I, I prefer to just keep recording, uh, yeah. Instead of just making another video, right? So I will just keep going. If you have, if, if you if you don't have any problem with that, okay. I mean, we'll, we are almost there, but yeah. Okay, so let me show you something. 
So as we said, uh, so we had a code, right? In which um, we had our code already that basically has uh, the topologic uh, structure, right? For a quad patch, right? That is basically the first code that I show you there, right? So the only thing that you need to modify to that code is just to modify the positions of those vertices, right? So now, because now you, you know how to compute Bezier curves and Bezier splines, right? You can use those functions, right? Basically, your, you, you will basically need a function if you give, for example, three, uh, three, three points, you will need to create a function that basically computes that uh, geometrical construction that I show you uh, before, and that will basically create four points from one side and four points for the other side. So now you have, you know that you will need to interpolate your positions between two between two uh, cubic Bezier curves, right? One on the left side and one on the right side. So if you have, for example, uh, if you for your curve in particular, you want to have, uh, I don't know, like forty segments, right? You know that the first 20 segments will be interpolated on the left uh, cubic basic curve and the other 20 segments will be computed on the um, right side uh, of these uh, curves, right? So basically, you, literally, you need to divide 50-50, right? Like 50% 50 of your, of your uh, steps are going to be in one side and the other 50% on the other side. So now you have enough functions already to basically combine them with the other um, with the other code, and you can basically create a way more sophisticated mesh, right? So here's an example. So here I have something that I'm just like taking this way further, right? And the I have a lot of uh, a lot of points here. So I'm not even I, I I don't even have only three control points, but I have a lot of control points here. So I I have uh, the first line of control points, which are these ones in blue. Then I have, for example, these guys in green, right? So basically, my code will interpolate a Bezier spline, right? Like interpolating the blue ones, another Bezier spline interpolating the green ones, another Bezier interpolating the, the red ones, right? And then, right? And that information is basically, it will basically create a custom mesh using exactly the same logic, the, sa the same topologic logic from the same, from the first code, right? So let me run my code. And no, this is not the right code. Uh, this is this one. Okay. Make space. Yeah, and that's the surface. See? So the surface is interpolating the points. And it has a beautiful grid topology, right? I've modified this a little bit. So in this case, I uh, I just simplify. Instead of creating triangles, I'm just creating quads. It was uh, I thought it was easier for you to visualize the mesh, right? Uh, but yeah, but this is this is a way you create custom. Uh, you can create custom models. And they can be like way, way more sophisticated than only like a cube or something like that, right? And someone is asking, what is the difference between this and patch surface? Well, this is somehow a patch. This is a patch, right? So every, yeah, I mean, every, if you can imagine that there's, there's, that there are like splines going through these points right here, right? Splines. Every every section that has four sides like this this is basically a patch right maybe your question is related with other type of surfaces because in computer graphics there are a lot of different surfaces and we have also nerves and and, and um, tensor product patch surfaces so there are other types of surfaces and uh, they're sometimes geometrically similar or the type of, of, of surface that you can obtain is is uh, similar but in this case, this in particular, this are, this is a surface created using Bezier uh, splines, right? So yeah. But yeah, there are, again, there are a lot of different types of surfaces, 
And again, that is that is basically covered on this on that other other course, right? So if I move the control points, I my surface will be modified, right? So this is exactly what is what is uh, what's used, for example, to create the famous Utah teapot. I think a lot of you already know this model, right? This is this was basically the first parametric model in computer graphics, okay? And uh, so it was created by uh, Martin Newell, if I remember correctly, from from the University of Utah. And it is part of, of the primitives on trees to the max. It's just like, yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing in trees to the max. They just included the Utah teapot. And, um, but yeah, but it's, 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 it's a parametric model, right? So give me a second. So obviously, I mean, I can obviously modify its radius. I can modify its segments, right? Because, right, we have some equations there that I can modify and I can modify the segments, right? And I can modify like which parts of the body I can see, only the handle or the lid or whatever, right? And uh, let me show you. These are actually these are actually the original, um, uh, like the original sketches from Martin Noel when he was created this. I think this this was in in the seventies. I, I don't remember the year. Maybe it's there. No, I, I don't think so. So I let me show you. So here's like a like zoom, so you can see how uh, he was basically like getting this this paper, and he was basically pointing, putting like the vertices right for this spline constructions right to create the Utah teapot, um, and again the same principle here, exactly the same, uh, yeah, exactly the same principle of creating. Creating a, a specific topology, a specific algorithm to create a, a specific topology, and and defining points in space using Bayesian curves or Bayesian splines can be used for creating whatever you want, basically whatever you want. So, uh, for example, in a video game company, if 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 uh, I don't know, imagine imagine you are, I was talking about this uh, a day ago with one of your classmates. If uh, if you're, for example, uh, a VFX company and you're you're creating a new a new movie for whatever Avengers, right? And suddenly, um, and the script says that you need to you need to show a I don't know a, a planet full of monsters, right? And you need to create ten thousand monsters because you will basically have like a battle or things like that. Each of those ten thousand monsters that will appear in, in the movie. They cannot have exactly the same body, right? Some of them need so some of them need to be like a little a, li a little bit taller, a little bit like or maybe stronger or not. Uh, the 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 clothes need to be a little bit different, right? So usually, you will have uh, a a group of artists from the art department that they will create like the concept art from those monsters, and they will may maybe create like two, three, four different variations from those monsters. Then you have the modeling department, also artists that will create like those models, right? Maybe again, with maybe two, three or four different versions with different heights or different body shapes or things like that. And then you have the people that is doing coding, which usually earn more money. <laughs> uh, that is basically the type of, the type of uh, people like you, right? People with um, computer science experience with math experience and with computer computer graphic skills and that basically the work of those people is to automate what the artists are doing right so for example in that case you will basically need to um, to understand the geometry of that those monsters for example and basically to create a, a procedural parametric modeling Model, sorry, a procedural parametric version of those monsters, right? Using algorithms, and now you have you can have a plugin that you can say, okay, plugin, give me five thousand monsters, all different, right? The, that and and also I mean they obviously complain complain with the the structure and the type and the artistic type of of the artist, but you don't need to have right one hundred artists manually creating ten thousand ten thousand monsters, right? So yeah, that this is basically what what you can use to create um, uh, parametric geometry, okay? Custom parametric geometry, and finally, give me a second. Um, if you 
And again, I mean, <laughs> with enough time, enough, <laughs> enough time and patience, you could create parametric tires or wheels or cars or whatever you want, and you could sell them or, yeah. <laughs> okay, so give me a second. I need to show you another thing. I think it's this web page here. Yes, so for example, if you want to experiment with that in 3.js, uh, this web page here, 3, 3 .js, well, it's 3gsfundamentals.org. Yeah, I mean, here is the... Here is the, the link, it will be obviously in the video. Uh, you can see here the, the code you need to create custom meshes in 3.js. You don't need this for your, for your next assignment because your next assignment will be a ray tracer and it will be entirely on C++. And part of that assignment will be to create triangle meshes. And so you basically will need to implement this using C++. But if you like, to experiment or do things like that in 3.js. This is basically the code. Uh, I, I, I search on the internet searching for several uh, examples. I think this one is pr probably the most complete example. And uh, yeah, so you can basically yeah play with my code or combine with this type of things. And it's basically exactly the same structure. You need to create um, a, an array of vertices, an array of faces, and then you create your custom meshes. The, the part that is uh, a bit tricky and I am not covering on the on on uh, I am not covering here because again we just wouldn't have time enough time to to discuss is uh, the procedural creation of your texture coordinates that is something that obviously will take a lot of a lot of implementation uh, and, and a lot of time and is not is not completely trivial but uh, but yeah but if you want to experiment you can you can experiment with, with that okay so now. We already have one hour, um, but I still need to give you the introduction to ray tracing, okay? I promise it will be a bit fast. So, questions? Any questions? No? Where's Nam? Nam is Nam has all, he has always uh, questions, right? Okay, so ray tracing. Ray tracing is a different paradigm to create renders. We have discussing. <laughs> well, yeah, we are we were discussing uh, real time rendering, right? This uh, rendering pipeline. This is a totally different idea. Okay, and uh, so basically the idea is this: you have a camera in three D space. And that camera has an image plane associated, right? So basically just a tiny square with whatever number of pixels on X on X axis and whatever number of pixels on Y axis, right? It's basically just in front of the camera. But, but again, this is totally in 3D space. There are no weird transformations here. There are no frustum or things like that. You just have a camera in 3D space, an image plane, and you basically take the coordinates of those pixels in 3D space, and you create rays, you throw rays from the camera in the direction of those pixels. So for example, this ray in particular will be this position minus the camera position, and you basically just create a ray. And you throw a ray to the world, um, hoping to hit, to hit something, right? And whatever you hit something, in this case, you're hitting, for example, the sphere, you have you need to compute the intersection between that ray and your sphere, and you now have a point in that surface from which you can compute the color, right? Because in the end, you are basically throwing an array for each pixel, which means that you would need to compute the color of that pixel in particular, right? So once you get you got there, you compute the normal of that surface, and you have the light, right? And usually what we're doing in ray tracing is, again, we throw a ray from from the camera to the surface, and then we throw another ray from this intersection to the camera, and we use exactly the same, exactly the same shaders formulas for blin, fong, anisotropic, or any other shader that you are, for example, working right now in your on your assignment, uh, to compute the color of this thing. That that's it. So ray tracing basically is is trying to mimic uh, what happens kind of in real in real life. The only difference is that in real life, the things, is, the things are a bit different. 
what usually happens is that light comes from the light source, right? So imagine that we are throwing photons from the light source. So a photon could be something similar to a ray, right? So imagine that I'm throwing a ray from the light, and then, <coughs> which is basically a photon, and then that photon or that, that uh, uh, light beam, right, is basically colliding with this surface in particular, and then it's probably reflected, right? It's being reflected to the camera, and it's basically coming to your eyes, right? So basically what we see in real life is just photons that come originally from out of space, right, from the sun if it's outside, and they're basically coming to the earth and bouncing on different surfaces and then bouncing and just falling in, in our eyes, right? And yeah, our eyes are basically photon detectors, right? So this is basically a way to compute computer graphics that is kind of like backwards, right? Instead of sending rays from the light, hoping them to get into the camera, we send rays from the camera, right? And then computing its uh, position, sorry, its, uh, its direction with respect to the light, right? Sending another ray. Now let, let, let's see how can we compute the most, the, the most basic ray tracing uh, version, okay? That is basically ray tracing a sphere. So if we want to compute uh, the color of a sphere using ray trace, we need to, we need to send a ray for each pixel through that sphere and basically compute the intersection between the sphere and the ray. Once we have that intersection and we compute the normal and we, if we have a light, right, we have enough information to compute the color exactly as we were doing in, again, Blin or Funk, right? So let's see how can we do this. So let's assume that we have a camera, right, uh, in, a, in a position called C. We have a ray, which is a normalized vector, right? So we, for now, we will assume that ray is already normal, sorry, it's already unitary, so it's already normalized. And we have an image plane, right? So for each, each uh, pixel on this image plane, we will basically send a ray. So in this case, I'm sending this ray, and I want to compute the intersection between that ray and this sphere, which has a position called S and a radius called R, right? Okay, so the first thing that you need to do is basically to uh, compute the angle between this vector V1, which is basically the vector between the camera and the center of the, of the sphere, right? So V1 is S minus C. And we need to compute this angle, right? Angle theta. So angle theta will be the inverse cosine of the dot product between the normalized version of V1. So I, I put a little hat, right? So remember, one, whenever you see a vector with a tiny hat on top, it means that this vector is unitary, right? So you need to make the make it uh, unitary. So a, a dot product between the unitary version of V1 and ray, which is already unitary, and you compute the angle, right? So then, we will need to compute this distance, d, right? Which is basically the distance from the center of the sphere to the ray, okay? To the, this line that is represented by this ray. And you can we, you can use uh, tri trigonometry, right? You will need this distance right here, d1, which is basically the projection of v1 over ray, right? So it's basically a dot product, v1 dot ray, that will give me this distance right here. And now, because I have d1 and I have this angle, I can compute d as just d1 times the tangent of theta, right? Again, there are other ways in which you could compute this, right? In this case, I'm using trigonometry, right? It's very simple. Okay, good. So now we have distance d, right? Now, what I want is not distance d, but this distance, right? Because I need to compute this point right here. I need to compute the point i, right? So if I have this distance, it will be very easy for me, right? Because I just need to basically scale the ray vector to this distance and I will get to the intersection. So basically I need to first compute this distance right here. I, I, I call this distance A, distance A, right? So do I have enough information to compute A? Well, it turns out that I, I do because this angle right here is a right angle, right? Do you agree? Because again, remember this was basically the projection between V1 and this vector. So this is a right angle, right? So I have D, I have this is a right angle, and I have this distance, right? Because this distance happens to be R, 
right? This is obviously R. So I have R, I have D, this is a right angle. I, I can use Pythagoras theorem to compute the distance A, which is the square root of uh, R2 minus D2, right? I can compute A. And then if I have A, I can compute B by just uh, getting D1, which is basically A plus B, right? I get D1, right? Which I had already, minus A, and I get B. So my intersection will be my ray, right? This vector that is unitary times this distance B plus the origin of camera. And that's it. That is that is a code. And how you compute the normal, because remember, the, you need to compute the intersection and then you need to compute the normal. So the way you compute the normal is you basically, because it's a sphere, right? It's super simple. You just take uh, the intersection minus the, the center of the sphere, right? And you just normalize, right? It is horrible. This tiny hat is horrible, but just imagine that it's not that horrible. <laughs> and this is basically a unitary version of I minus S. And that's it. This is a, this most basic uh, ray tracing thing. And that is basically just throwing rays through, through spheres. So your, again, I will release the coding assignment today, very later today because, very late today because yeah, I have a lot of things to do and I still need to prepare a couple of things, but I will, I will uh, release today. And basically your coding assignment will be to create a ray tracer. You're either, you can either, to, you can either choose to create the ray tracer completely from scratch and we will give you a book that has uh, like every single line of code and everything is explained. So my recommendation, and I, I yeah, I, I, I want you, if you can, to, to, to write it everything from scratch, but you will also have access to the code uh, in case you have problems uh, while in implementing this. And, um, and you will see that basically the, the, the first, yeah, the first maybe 80% or 90% or of, of the entire ray tracer will be uh, just using spheres, right? So intersecting spheres with rays, that is basically the, the base and you already have the math, okay? Uh, so that's it for today. Yes, that's it for today. So any questions? Okay, so we took, oh, it's not that bad, it's 4, 417. I thought we were taking more time. Yes, David has a question, give me a second. Oh, what happened? Uh, yeah. Just to clarify, is this Maybe. the same ray tracing we're talking about here, uh, the same as the one Sorry. we talked about in the Sorry, past? I, I was not able to hear you. Uh, my volume was... Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just want to clarify, if it, uh, is this the same ray tracing we talked about uh, when we were uh, talking about like creating shadows with the ray trace? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when we talk about it's the same. Way. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's yeah. It's it's it's, it's very similar. Uh, yes. Remember that we when we were talking about shadows, one of those type of shadows was ray tracing shadows. That yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, is. That's why I want it to is exactly the same. It the is same. exactly the same. And that that's will like be also part of your of your assignment, by the way, to compute shadows oh, okay. using yeah, yeah. Ray, ray tracing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The thing is, I mean. I will obviously I will keep talking about this uh, on on Friday, right? We will keep talking about uh, geometry and ray tracing and uh, yeah things related with ray tracing because from now on it will be only ray tracing. But basically, ray tracing yeah. is a technology. Is you can see it as a as a generic technology of just shooting rays and intersecting with geometries. And we will use it for everything. We will use uh, we will use uh, ray tracing for uh, computing the colors of a surface for computing uh, reflection, if you have like a mirror-like material, for computing refraction, if you have materials like glass or things like that, you can use uh, ray tracing for computing, uh, to compute um, uh, shadows. So yeah, shooting rays okay. will be just yeah, like generic math to, to compute all those things. I see, thank you. Good. Any other question? Okay, good. So, uh, and remember, if you haven't done it, uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously voluntary. So, I mean, if you don't, if you don't want it to do this, it's perfectly fine. But if you want, and if you have time and energy, 
it will be nice if you can uh, go and uh, answer the uh, course survey it's on piazza and uh yeah so i will appreciate your feedback and that's it thank you so much and see you on see you on friday and i will have my office hour today yeah for 4 30 to 5 30 if in, in case you you want to 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 connect see you bye everybody <laughs>